Hello everyone and welcome to this review of Major Depressive Disorder by Early Career Researchers of the Major Depressive Disorder Workgroup of the PGC. My name is Kim Kendall and I'm a psychiatrist from the MRC Centre for Neuropsychiatric Genetics and Genomics at Cardiff University and I'm going to talk to you about the phenotype of depression and its epidemiology. Depression is a common mood disorder which has the potential to substantially impact on an individual's morbidity and mortality. It's characterized by the core features of depressed mood, which may manifest as sadness, but also of feelings of irritability or emptiness, and anhedonia, which is a decreased ability to feel pleasure. Individuals with depression will tend to also experience a wide range of symptoms, which can be broadly categorized into emotional, neurovegetative, and cognitive symptoms. Depression is a very phenotypically heterogeneous disorder. And a study of individuals with, with the disorder from the STAR-D trial found over a thousand unique symptom profiles and the commonest was only endorsed by 1.8% of the sample. The term depression is also used inconsistently, both in research and in clinical practice. And a diagnosis can be reached in multiple different ways using different criteria. So this clearly has implications for translating research findings to the clinic. Some have suggested that the disorder might be better conceptualized as an umbrella term for multiple related disorders or disorder subtypes which have different risk factors. The 12 month prevalence of depression is thought to be around 6% and the lifetime prevalence between around 15 and 18, 18%. The peak of onset uh, extends from mid to late adolescence to the early 40s, with the median onset being in the mid 20s. Established epidemiological risk factors for depression include age, sex, marital status, and socioeconomic status. And there are elevated rates of comorbidity with other psychiatric disorders and also physical health disorders. In some situations, these associations can move in either direction, but these, this is difficult to untangle and unpick with the existing data. So to summarize, depression is a common phenotypically heterogeneous disorder which has multiple risk factors crossing the biological, psychological and social domains. There are high rates of comorbidity with other disorders and some untangling some of these associations can be quite difficult. I'll now hand you over to Lu Yi for her section of the review. Hi everyone, this is Lu Yi. Um, today I'm going to talk about the genetic epidemiology in MDD. It is really clear that MDD is a complex disorder, so neither gene or environment plays a role alone. Early evidence suggested that MDD runs in family with an increased risk in the first degree relatives of MDD patients compared to those in controls. But how much does it attributable to gene and environment respectively? The answer to which um, will guide our current gene mapping effort. Heritability is a key concept in genetics. It is the proportion of phenotypic variants attributable to additive genetics. It is typically estimated from twin studies um, based on the expected genetics and uh, environmental sharing within the twin pairs. Now, there is a long history of twin studies. Here, I will just go through a few key papers. The first one is a meta-analysis from two decades ago, and yet this estimate of 37% is still the one uh, most cited MDD heritability to date. Next one is the single largest twin study, and um, the third one is the largest meta-analysis of all twin studies in the past 50 years. The last one is a more recent study. It has a higher, um, snip, uh, higher estimate, potentially due to higher severity in the treated cases. Overall, the heritability estimates from the twin studies are fairly similar. But twin studies rely on some key assumptions, especially the common environmental assumption between the two twin types. 
um, they, this was relevant in the missing heritability estimate, um, the a missing heritability debate, um, because um, some suspected that these twin heritability might have been overestimated. Um, what are other lines of evidence? So there is a growing literature of heritability estimation based on population-based register or electronic health record data. These studies reconstruct the extended pedigree um, based on either recorded or inferred familial relationships. The estimates here are fairly similar to those from twin studies. So there seem to be very limited evidence for overestimation. Now, is there a sex difference in MDD heritability? The motivation there is to see if the higher female prevalence can be explained by a higher genetic component. Now, um, as shown in the figure, um, the heritability does seem to be higher in females than in males, um, but early meta-analysis failed to detect a significant difference, whereas the other studies showed uh, a genetic correlation between sexes much lower than one, but with wide confidence interval. The more um, recent study based on the siblings were able to provide a much more precise estimate of about 0.9. So despite a higher MDD heritability in females, the majority of genetic risks are still shared across sexes. Now, given the low heritability of MDD, it will be really useful to uh, identify clinical subtypes that are more heritable. One successful example is a converge consortium where they ascertained the recurrent MDD cases in women to enhance the GWAS power. Early evidence was only able to establish recurrent MDD as a more heritable uh, form, but recent studies using the um, large um, population-based data were able to extend the evidence to suggest that the subtypes of, of uh, early age of onset, comorbid anxiety disorder, higher severity, and postpartum depression as more heritable forms. Now, to summarize, MDD heritability is uh, um, within the range of 30 to 50%, but it is important to note that um, um, heritability is population and time specific. Now, there are sex differences and subtypes that are more heritable. Um, the combination of this high prevalence and low heritability makes it really challenging for gene mapping, which you will hear more from Eva next. Thank you. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. My name is Eva Schulte, and I work at the Department of Psychiatry and the Institute of Psychiatric Phenomics and Genomics at the University of Munich. I would like to tell you a little bit about candidate genes and rare variation in MDG genetics. Ever since people discovered that there was this underlying heritable component to MDD, they set out to try to identify that genetic component. So over the course of 40 years, more than 1,500 individual studies and more than 200 genes were assessed. Candidate genes belong to pathways considered either biologically plausible or implicated in drugs used in the clinical practice to treat MDD. Most of these studies were pretty small and even in um, large meta-analyses of the data that is out there, only seven common variants showed significant association with the MDD phenotype. And that is really not much more than would be expected by chance. So overall, um, these results were very inconsistent and the studies that have been performed only had limited power and also did not correct for population stratification. The candidate genes that have been suggested all have minor allele frequencies and odds ratios that would make them um, detectable in the current GWAS that we have. However, the current GWAS have not lent support to either the classical candidate genes or the pathways that they're implicated in. Also, systematic analyses of the most commonly studied polymorphisms in 18 candidate genes in the UK Biobank data and the PGC MDD data found little evidence of association with um, several different definitions of depression. So overall, there is no sound evidence for genetic variation in candidate genes in the context of depression. And many funding bodies and also many researchers have suggested that we stop looking for it. So, <coughs> sorry. 
So genome-wide association studies have been very successful in identifying um, genetic factors implicated in MDD. So why are we even interested in looking at additional genetic variants if we already have these common variants? The reason is that common variants only harbor very small effect sizes. And therefore, the identification of larger, um, of rare alleles, which are expected to harbor larger effect sizes, would be very, very beneficial because it is much better able to inform the underlying biology of the disease. And to me, at least, that is the, st the um, main reason why I'm interested in studying the genetics of MDD. Rare variants are currently mostly analyzed using whole exome sequencing data. However, um, costs are still prohibitive and sample sizes that are needed are so large that, at least to my knowledge, there is no effort currently to um, compare just MDD cases to controls. And many people have resorted to assessing subphenotypes, such as sex differences, suicide completion, treatment resistance, family studies, and population isolates and early onset MDD. Well, of course, it is very difficult to summarize all of these studies into just one sentence. I think that it is fair to say that overall, there is an enrichment in singular rare and low frequency variants in specific cases, but most of these studies fail to reach both statistical significance due to limited power, and they also lack replication. Next to the rare single nucleotide variants, copy number variants may present another form of genetic um, variation that may be implicated in the genetic architecture of MDD. However, here too, one of the problems is that very few high-powered studies have been performed, um, although there are ongoing um, efforts by the PGC to rectify that. One large-scale study showed that there was an increase in genome-wide burden of rare short deletions in MDD, which map mostly to intergenic regions and there to enhancer regions, suggesting that they may alter RNA expression levels. Also, Kim Kendall, using a large-scale data from the UK Biobank, showed that there were 53 CNVs of known association with neurodevelopmental disorders, which are also associated with self-reported depression. Um, taken together, these data suggest that there may be a risk increase, which is carried by CNVs. However, there is no evidence for large effect multigenic CNVs, such as those that we see in schizophrenia or autism spectrum disorders, in the genetic architecture of MDD. To summarize, genetic variation in candidate genes does not seem to contribute to the genetic architecture of MDD. Rare variants and rare CNVs may influence MDD risk, However, no final conclusion can be drawn at this point with regard to the amount of heritability that they carry. Still, it is useful to look for rare variants because of the larger effect sizes and therefore the better ability to inform underlying biology that they carry compared to common variants. With that, I would like to thank you for your attention and I would like to hand over to Till and Laura who will tell you a lot more about the role of common variants in the genetic architecture of MDD. Hi. I'm Till and like Eva, I'm also from Munich and I'm going to talk about genome-wide association studies on MDD. If you don't know what a GVAS is at all, then you could also watch my other video called What is a GVAS that introduces you to the topic. Unlike the rare variants that you've just heard about, GVAS are typically conducted on SNPs with a minor allele frequency of at least 1% or higher. Until 2015, GBAS and MDD identified either no genome-wide significant loci or very few, up to two in the Chinese study by the Converge Consortium. This changed from 2016 on when the sample sizes increased and more and more gene genome-wide significant loci were identified. These increased sample sizes were mainly made possible by the efforts of the PGC, but also by 23andMe and UK Biobank that also contributed large samples. I'm going to introduce you to the biology of MDD as discovered by genomide association studies. And for this, I'm going to use the 2018 study by the PGC. This study analyzed about 135,000 MDD cases, and they were mainly from cohorts from the PGC, but they also included several other cohorts, notably a large one from 23andMe. So among these 135,000 cases were many with a self-reported diagnosis of depression. This study identified genome-wide significant variants at 44 independent loci. 
And as is always the case in genomide association studies, it's difficult to tell which genes these variants actually influence. But when using positional overlap of genes at these identified loci, one can see that many of the putative genes at these associated loci have functions in neuride outgrowth, in synaptic function and plasticity, but also in immunity and inflammation. This study also conducted magma-based gene level and gene set analysis. And in these gene level analyses, many genes were found that code for pre- and postsynaptic proteins, and especially receptor subunits, for example, voltage-gated calcium channels, the dopamine receptor DRD2, and many different glutamate receptor subunits. Gene set analysis found pathways that are important for neuronal differentiation and protection, for the immune response, and mainly for synapse function. And here, it really appears to be synaptic plasticity, and especially postsynaptic plasticity, that plays an, a very important role in the development of depression and other common psychiatric disorders, like, for example, schizophrenia. With all of its players, from presynaptic piccolo to voltage-gated calcium channels in the postsynapse to RNA-binding proteins like fMRP that regulate local translation and regulate how glutamate receptor subunits are either incorporated or removed from the um, synaptic membrane, all of this um, appears to be really important in the development of psychiatric disorders, at least from uh, the genetic point of view. New GWAS on MDD are now being published um, <laughs> basically every few months. The last published one is from last year, and it identified 102 independent variants already. And to achieve this, it combined cases from the PGC, from 23andMe, and from UK Biobank. So it's a combination of cases with different phenotype definitions. In this GBAS, the variants explained by depression polygenic risk scores remain to be low. So the pseudo R square ranged from 1.5 to 3%, and that's not too good yet. Recently, a preprint of an even larger GBAS on depression has been uploaded. It analyzed 340,000 cases, and um, in addition to the cases already analyzed before, it now includes also the Million Veteran program. Importantly, it also includes trans-ancestry meta-analysis with African-American samples. Well, to sum up, so far dozens or better hundreds of independent variants associated with depression have been identified, but each of them has very small individual effect sizes, so odds ratios of up to 1.05. The ide identified genes indicate that pathophysiological mechanisms of neuron development, synaptic plasticity, and also inflammation might play an important role. And many of the identified genes overlap with findings for other psychiatric disorders, as for example, schizophrenia. In general, one can say that maybe the identification of depression risk variants has been a bit more challenging than for other psychiatric disorders like schizophrenia, and that's likely because MDD has a higher prevalence, a lower heritability, and possibly the patients are more heterogeneous. It is important to point out that phenotype definitions matter for depression, so it makes a difference. You get different genetic results on whether the cases were defined by the diagnostic interviews or self-report or ICD codes or whatever. So phenotype-induced heterogeneity might be an important focus of future work like um, trans-ancestry analysis. And now, Jürgen Luix will tell you more about genetic correlations. We'll briefly discuss the genetic correlations that have been found for MDD over the past decade or so, maybe less. First, to start, um, what did I do to get to these genetic correlations? First, um, like a brief introduction to what uh, exactly a genetic correlation is. It's a statistical measure of correlation between genetic underpinnings of one trait and genetic pin underpinnings of the other, and it can range from one being perfect positive genetic correlation to minus one, which is perfect negative. And so I extracted the genetic correlation results from recent genome-wide association studies where I focused on the largest um, GWAS for MDD, but also some other studies that um, specifically delved into other kinds of uh, phenotypes to see whether there's genetic correlations. 
Um, so first is maybe a graph you're familiar with. Um, it's derived from the recent cell cross disorder paper that came out last year, where basically what you can appreciate from the graph is that MDD is almost uh, right in the middle, um, grouping with bipolar disorder and schizophrenia on the one hand, and also with autism spectrum disorders and ADHD. Um, and it's associated with 48%, so almost half of the 109 pleiotropic loci that have been found across these eight main uh, psychiatric disorders. So I think first to show um, a graph from the Brinkstrom paper where um, um, psychiatric and neurological disorders were compared and genetic correlation analyses were run. Basically, there's very few genetic correlations between um, neurological and psychiatric traits, um, except for uh, MDD and migraine and ADHD and uh, migraine. And for the rest, there's very little um, overlap um, across neurological traits and also between MDD on one hand and other uh, neurological traits. So I think this is an important graph to show the, like the main genetic correlations that have been found in the two largest GWAS uh, studies that have also been discussed by Till. Um, so on the left, you see the Ray et al. Nature Genetics 2018 paper, where on the top, you see that depressive symptoms, not surprisingly, uh, list very high. Um, has a genetic correlation of almost 1, 0 0.9. Um, and on the right panel, you see a graph from the Howard and All Nature Neuroscience 2019 GWAS, where basically depressive symptoms were also ranking highest. Um, not surprisingly, I think for a psychiatrist, neuroticism also ranks really high. And when you look at genetic negative correlations on the right, you see that subjective well-being, um, college completion um, are negatively associated with uh, MDD. Um, another study that I found of interest um, is um, a study relating um, different kinds of mood disorders. Um, such as bipolar 2 disorder and bipolar disorder type 1 and different kinds of major depressive disorders, so recurrent, single and subthreshold depression. And what you can appreciate from this graph where the genetic correlations are also depicted in these numbers is that recurrent major depressive disorder has a way higher genetic correlation, more than double with bipolar disorder type 2 than with bipolar disorder type 1. And I think as a clinician, um, I think you can, you know, you can basically understand because it's, it's also apparent in the clinic where sometimes bipolar 2 disorder has less clear manic episodes, hypomania, whereas bipolar 1 disorder has clear manic episodes, so being kind of a distinct phenotype. So I think this is kind of confirming what we also see in uh, clinical practice um, a lot. Um, and obviously recurrent major depressive disorder, single episode uh, major depressive disorder and subthreshold disorder, depression have very high genetic correlations if you compare them to other uh, mood disorders. Um, and then atypical symptoms. So these are um, symptoms that are not commonly seen in most um, depressive episodes. Maybe they're seen, they're observed in about 10 to 20% of um, major depressive episodes. So these are increased appetites and increased weight. Um, so if you look at the graph on the right, this is a genetic correlation graph with BMI. And what is apparent is that this subtype of MDD with atypical symptoms, so increased appetite and weight, is strongly genetically um, correlated with BMI, whereas other subtypes of MDD, decreased appetite, for example, are not associated with BMI. So in conclusion, uh, genetic correlations for MDD are strongest for mood and personality related traits being social well-being, depressive symptoms, and neuroticism. And for, with that, I would like to conclude and thank you so much for your attention. Hi, my name is Carmel Choi and I'm a clinical and research fellow at Mass General Hospital, Harvard Medical School, and the Harvard School of Public Health. My research focuses on data-driven methods to inform our understandings of psychological resilience, protective factors, and depression prevention. As my colleagues have now mentioned, genetic factors play an important role in influencing depression risk. However, environmental factors still explain a large proportion of variation in depression outcomes. And as such, scientists have been very interested in how genes might interact with these environmental factors to shape depression risk. The earliest efforts 
involved candidate gene by environment interaction. And a global summary of these efforts is basically no robust large scale evidence for interactions involving candidate genes like the serotonin transporter gene or otherwise in combination with environmental exposures when it comes to depression. So moving from candidate genes to empirical evidence that has drawn on genome wide data. This early study from Roseanne Peterson, Ken Kendler, and the Converge team found that genetic influences on depression seem to vary by environmental exposure. And they identified GWAS hits for depression only in individuals who were unexposed to adversity. And though the differences were not significant, they observed slightly higher SNP based heritability in the unexposed group as well. On the other hand, recent findings from Johnny Coleman, Jerome Breen and team in the UK Biobank have suggested somewhat of the opposite, where heritability of depression was actually higher among individuals who reported lifetime trauma exposure compared to those who did not report such exposure. And so these studies drew on quite different populations and samples and suggest that the genetics of depression may vary depending on the characteristics and the type of environment under study. There have been other studies now that have used polygenic scores to aggregate genome-wide effects and examine how these scores interact with life adversities. A study from NESDA in the Netherlands found a significant interaction where polygenic risk was more strongly associated with depression in individuals who were exposed to childhood trauma. On the other hand, a study led by Neve Mullins in the UK found the reverse, where polygenic influences were stronger among individuals who were unexposed to childhood trauma. And then a later combined effort that included these prior studies, as well as some others, found not much evidence for polygenic interactions with childhood trauma. Despite this being you know, a large pooled effort, the combined sample size was still quite small, as you can see. And so in the UK Biobank, which is one of the largest single databases available right now, groups have found significant interactions between polygenic risk for depression and traumatic life events, including Johnny's earlier study that found an additive interaction, and Shen from Andrew McIntosh's group in Edinburgh, reporting a similar finding where polygenic effects for depression were stronger among individuals exposed to childhood trauma specifically, though not necessarily later life events. And so by far the most common gene environment interaction studies have focused on stress, trauma, and life adversity, but other potential exposures have also been examined. Our group, as well as colleagues in the Netherlands, have looked at social support as another kind of environmental factor. And what both studies found in quite different samples are main effects, where polygenic risk is associated with more depression as expected, social support is associated with protective effects on depression, but these effects were relatively independent of each other. Similarly, we recently looked at physical activity as another kind of exposure, and again we found independent, non-interactive effects with polygenic risk. And this suggests that even if you are at higher genetic risk for depression, higher levels of physical activity may still help to reduce the risk of depression. And this may apply for other environmental factors as well. And finally, another genetically informed approach to mention is to look at environmental effects on depression using Mendelian randomization as a way to triangulate potential causal effects. We recently provided an example of this by looking at the relationship between physical activity and depression using two sample MR. And we recently extended this to look at a wider range of other modifiable exposures that were screened in the UK Biobank. And so there are a lot of exciting directions for gene environment work. There are new methods to study whole genome by environment wide interactions. We need to rule out gene environment correlations and also address the heterogeneity of measurement of environments. And we will continue to need large and well powered uh, analyses in diverse samples to be able to test and detect these interactions. So with that, I will pass this talk along to Evelyn, who will wrap things up for us. Thank you so much. Hello everyone, my name is Evelyn Manassen. I'm a psychiatrist currently working in Germany and I have the pleasure to conclude this presentation with a short summary. 
So we've been discussing depression, which is a highly prevalent common disorder and very debilitating for the patients. We have discussed that it's phenotypically very heterogeneous and it has a heritability of around 30 to 50%. Studies have shown that there is a strong polygenicity with over 100 loci that contribute to the disorder risk, which is related to neuronal growth, synaptic function, and inflammation. It is possible that there are some subtypes that are more heritability, including early onset depression and for example, postpartum depression, but also the recurrence and severity of depression can be considered as potential subtypes. Furthermore, we see an important role for environmental factors, including stressors such as childhood trauma, socioeconomic adversity, but also protective aspects such as social support and physical activity. In short, we can state that an individual's genetic makeup likely impacts the disease course from prevention to diagnosis, treatment, and prognosis. This gives us potential applications for genetics in depression. For example, the development of pharmacological treatments can be genetically informed, and where genetically informed pharmacological modes of action can be targeted. Furthermore, we see a role for um, genetics in the discussion regarding disorder risk and treatment choice when we are talking about risk certification in prevention and interventions and personalized medicine. But also, we see a risk for genetic counseling for worried parents from one side, uh, but on the other side, also for the patient itself, when it comes about the shared risk of depression genes, but also physical health phenotypes. We still have a to-do list to finish um, as researchers in genetics and depression. For example, the exploration of stratification processes of depression, where more homogeneous disorder subtypes would be welcome. This could also help us increase the accuracy of the depression polygenic risk score with then new opportunities for risk gratification at the population level. Furthermore, this would also increase our understanding when it comes to the etiology, but also prevention and treatment opportunities that can benefit the patient. So in conclusion, understanding the genetics of depression helps us to improve our insight into the impact of genetic factors on depression, which in turn help us to improve clinical care, and let's hope it holds a bright future for the field. In the name of all the presenters, I would like to thank you for your attention.